What's up, guys? Welcome back to the MMA meeting, Let's Talk the Weasel podcast, where we talk all things MMA. Hope you guys have an amazing day. I've been killing it in Tekken 8 lately and watching back some of the UFC 298 fights. Every time I watch the Ilya Tapuria fight, I see more stuff. I see new things that he did in there. I see some of the footwork that he was able to utilize. I mean, even baiting out a lot of the jabs from Volkanovski in order to get those angles and weave his way in for openings. Ilya Tapuria might be the next dominant champion in the UFC. And he's getting better every time we see him. I mean, look at how much better he got in that Volkanovski fight compared to when he fought Josh Emmett. He looked way better. And from Josh Emmett, he looked way better than he did against Bryce Mitchell. The guy's 27 years old, and he's really living up to the younger guys adapting and evolving in the game to the highest level. The next time we see him, whether it's against Max Holloway or the winner of Yair and Ortega, or even against Mavsar Evloev, who knows? Depends on how those fights all go and what those fighters do in the meantime. We're going to see a better version of Ilya Tapuri and probably a more dangerous version than we saw against Alexander Volkanovsky, potentially. But there are a lot of champions that once they get the belt, they're not as dangerous as they used to be. Maybe some of the fire goes away or maybe they find a new style in order to hold the belt instead of risking losing it, right? This is something we saw with Israel Adesanya where he was a lot more exciting before he got the belt and then once he got it, he fought like he was just trying not to lose the belt. And this happened with Jose Aldo in the UFC too. Not for all of his fights, but for many of them. WC Aldo was different than UFC Aldo. And probably more dangerous than anything else from Tapuria is his confidence. I mean, isn't it crazy that this guy was making a documentary about his road to the title while he was preparing to fight arguably the greatest featherweight of all time, one of the best fighters in the world. And he needed to beat Volk in order to finish the film. And he beat him in the best fashion possible. The ending to getting that title of KOing Volk, him unconscious on the mat for minutes, Ilya Tapuria celebrating and he did what he sought out to do and what he was telling everybody he was going to do for months he's gonna knock this guy out he didn't do it as easy as he said but he knocked him out in the second round of that fight finishing the film he put the the champion status on his instagram before the fight i mean the guy's confidence is like conor mcgregor's levels and he rose the stakes during the build-up and overcame it all yo and i heard that real madrid congratulated him like they posted something and they're one of the biggest sports organizations in the entire world Ilya Tapuria might become the next big star that the ufc's been looking for right because we didn't have that big star you know maybe with Adesanya you had it you do have John Jones still but he's not as active Ilya Tapuria can be a massive star if he keeps a highlight reel of what he just did to Volkanovski just continue to keep going you know knocking everybody out staying undefeated is also very important there's not a lot of UFC champions that stay undefeated and we see how great it did for boxing in in the beginning before everybody was undefeated because they padded the records in the beginning where you had undefeated champions it was different because it was real these guys fought legit competition all the way up and you know I'm talking about the seven. 70s and 80s and you know maybe the early 90s having an undefeated champion is a very very big deal and it's a great selling point for the organization and Ilya Tapuria can be that especially if he goes on to defeat the legends of the featherweight division so he just defeated Volkanovski what if he defeats Max Holloway then he beats Volk again then he beats Yair then he beats Ortega like he could be that John Jones guy that cleaned out the featherweight legends and with Spain behind him with how much support he's getting from the football world, which is bigger than anything else in sports, there is a very big opportunity for Ilya Tapuria and the UFC. And I'm not surprised Dana said that they're looking to go in Spain right away, right? He didn't say the usual answer, right? Whenever someone asks him, are you going to go to Spain? Are you going to go to Africa? Are you going to go to China? Are you going to go to Hawaii? When they mentioned Spain, he did not say, oh, we'll see what happens. He said, we're going to Spain. I think it's because of all the support Tapuria is getting from that country and all the opportunities that the UFC can also gather behind that support from Real Madrid, all the celebrities over there in Spain backing up Ilya Tapuria. And I'm going to be honest, man, I don't know who beats him. I think Max has the best chance, but that's only if he comes out of this Gaethje fight correct. You know, if he's not completely damaged, which is impossible to think that he's going to come out of there unscathed, right? Gaethje's probably going to put a beating on him, but they're both going to put a beating on each other. But I think Max is going to take the bigger beating out of the two. And I cannot imagine he comes out the same way. And it, even still, Max is clearly not in his prime. I think it's pretty clear. There's some subtle techniques and subtle movements and He's not operating exactly the same way that you can tell that he's a little bit past his prime. He's still an elite fighter, one of the best fighters in the world, but he's not the same Max Holloway, you know, the guy that defeated Jose Aldo the second time, the guy that fought Volkanovski the first two times, arguably the third, you know, the guy that fought Kelvin Cater. That Max Holloway has regressed just a little bit. And after the Gaethje fight, that regression could be a lot. So if it's not Max, 
right? Let's say Tapuria beats him. He could even take him to the ground if the standup is a little too problematic because Max doesn't have the greatest takedown defense. Who else is there? Yair could present some head kicking threats and we know that Teporia sometimes will drop his hands and get head kicked this happened multiple times in his career he looks like he is addressing it it looks like he is fixing all of those defensive holes that he had in the past and that was shown in the Volk fight but Volk's head kicks were not masked up or set up right he was kind of just throwing them out there but again Yair kind of does the same thing sometimes he he's a little trickier he's a bit trickier than Volk with his head kicks but he doesn't have the best setups either that's another reason why he wasn't able to catch Volk but Islam was it doesn't mean that Islam is a more dexterous kicker than Yair Rodriguez he's not but he's smarter than Yair right he knew how to set up a simple roundhouse to the head where Yair did not do that right Yair was just throwing them out there trying to catch him moving into the kicks whereas Islam conditioned with the body kicks first then went up high so Yair doesn't set up his head kicks too bad too great he doesn't have like great technical setups which leads me to believe that maybe Tapuria will be able to block those and get right on the inside and from the inside Yair is probably gonna get melted and I think everybody gets melted by by Tapuria. He's probably the best pocket boxer in the UFC. I've been saying it for a while, and it's finally caught up to the best featherweight on the planet. I think everybody gets destroyed in the pocket with Tapuria. I don't think there's a single featherweight on the planet. You have to find lightweights to deal with that. Like, for example, Dustin Poirier, I believe, is a great pocket boxer that could deal with someone like Tapuria, but he's also way bigger than him. But Tapuria's a fighter that I don't see should be fighting in the lightweight division. He's just not big enough. He could definitely beat some of those guys, but... There is going to be a major size difference between him and like Islam Akashev, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje. You know, these guys are so much bigger than him. And then who else is that featherweight? You know, Ortega gets destroyed. None of his takedowns are going to work. He's going to get completely outboxed. Even doesn't hit as hard as Tapuria does. Mavsar is going to get his takedowns most likely stuffed. And he's going to get eaten alive in the stand-up. Arnold Allen can present some issues because he has really good footwork. But nothing offensive, I think, is going to get to Tapuria. And honestly, there's not a load of great prospects either. I mean, there is Diego Lopez. we got to see what he does. But he's so reckless. Great, great fighter to watch. Super fun. But comparing him to the elite right now, I just don't see him competing with someone like Tapuria. If Max does not beat Tapuria, I think he's going to go on a dominant run. It might even surpass some of the greats in the sport. Ilya Tapuria is a very special fighter, and it's crazy to think that people at one time thought that Paddy Pimblett could beat this guy. That was always crazy to me, even back then, like when people were saying, oh, Paddy would beat him in a fight. He's too big and all this stuff, and I was thinking, there's no way. Paddy's just not that good of a fighter, right? He's not anywhere comparable to someone like Tapuria, and now looking back at it, it's even crazier than I even thought. In that UFC 298 card, they had a huge gate. Over $7 million gate, 18000 in attendance, and it showed to me that, man, Volk is actually a bigger deal than probably some of us realized, because he's had some fights in the past that didn't sell too well, but after the Islam fight, it changed his star power, the first one, right, after the first Islam fight, and it's one of the few examples in the sport where a fighter coming off an official loss on the record did not affect their upward trajectory as a star. Right, there's a few examples of that, and Volk is one of them. And he's got one last chance, in my opinion, to continue with that star power, and that is in the rematch with Tapuria. The rematch with Tapuria is going to be a very big fight, and he has to make it all work there. Everything's going to ride on beating Tapuria again, but I think it gets beat worse. I think Ilya is going to be 30% better, and I think Volk is going to be worse than he was the last time. And I expect Tapuria to not only knock Volkanovski out, but I think he's going to dominate the fight. It's going to remind me of uh, Josie Aldo and Max Holloway in a sense, where in the first fight, Aldo had a lot of success. He even hurt Holloway a little bit. Fulkanovski in the first fight, he had a lot of success as well. He was landing some good jabs, some good leg kicks and body kicks. Head kicks were getting kind of close. He has some success compared to what the second fight is probably going to be. In the second fight with Aldo and Max, Aldo got destroyed. I was there alive. Like, he got annihilated. It was really hard to watch. You know, a legend like that. But he take, did take it up on short notice. It's supposed to be Frank Yeager in there. And I think something similar is going to happen with Volkanovski, where that legend just gets completely smoked from the beginning of the fight up until the finish. And uh, one of my friends showed me something really interesting. I don't know where he got it from. Did you know that Volkanovski and Jose Aldo's records at the end of their featherweight title reign were exactly the same? After the last featherweight championship fight they had, they were both 26 and 4, 1 and 3 in their last four fights. And they both lost their fights due to strikes. And Volkanovski officially had five title defenses. Whereas Jose Aldo, including WEC, which you have to include, he had nine. And it just goes to show you, as great as Volk was, still one of the greatest fighters of all time, he's arguably number one 
or number two, greatest featherweight of all time, it shows you how difficult those older champions that dominated their divisions, like Jose Aldo, like Anderson Silva, like GSP, John Jones, DJ, etc., how difficult it was to reign for a long time. Longevity is a very difficult thing to come across at the top level of the sport. Because anybody can beat you, right? You can have off nights. I'm not saying Volk had an off night, but things happen. You know what I'm saying? And it's not just that. You got all these contenders coming up. The third generation fighter, like I always mention. I've been talking about that for years. It's always been the most difficult opponent for every legend. Every single one of them with evidence. That's why we got to give a lot more respect to guys like Joel Zialdo and Anderson and GSP. What they were able to do, holding the belts for nine title defenses, 11 title wins, whatever it is. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I hope Volkanovski takes a long layoff. I hope he lets his brain rest and comes back in the rematch as healthy as he can because at his older age getting knocked out like that twice in a row within months is not a long stretch a big gap in between these knockouts and the second one was worse than the first he really needs to dot every i's and cross all the t's before he gets into this fight with Ilya Tapuri again and Ilya's on the top of the world right now man I, I looked at his Instagram he got like a million new Instagram followers overnight not even a whole day actually it was just a few hours he went from 2 million followers to 3 million instantly Instantly. Like, what is going on? One of his posts, the one where he posts, uh, posed with the belt, it got like 2 million likes in 12 hours or whatever it was. Absolutely insane, man. And then regarding the Coleman event with Robert Whitaker and Paulo Costa, I'm surprised that didn't get fight of the night. You know, I didn't look at it until the next day, you know, what the pulse fight bonuses were. I was thinking that it was going to be for sure Whitaker and Costa, but then they gave it to Mackenzie Dern and Amanda Lemos. If I look at it from like a casual's eyes, maybe because of how crazy it was, you know, she was leaking and stuff. It is Mackenzie Dern. She came back, you know, she was showing her heart and warrior spirit and all this stuff. Maybe in that sense, but I still don't put it above Whitaker and Costa. Whitaker and Costa was a great fight. And all those legends in the middleweight division, you know, the guys like Yoel, like Costa, like Whitaker, these guys always put on really good fights. And I was expecting Whitaker to dominate Costa more than he did, but it does show that he did decline a bit, right? It specifically showed with his ability, or sorry, inability to slip on those jabs, right? When you look at his fight with Israel Adesanya, you look at his fight with Marvin Vittori, and even, even with Jira Kenanir somewhat, he had a much much better slip on jabs. But against Costa, who was reaching from far range, which is supposed to be Whitaker's comfort zone, he wasn't able to slip them. He was getting popped in the face. He was moving back. There was that one point where Costa just threw a long one-two, telegraphed, and Whitaker just moved back and got hit by it. It was very strange, right? Whitaker doesn't usually do that. When Whitaker's from long range, he slips on punches very well. And I think we have seen a slight decline of Robert Whitaker after the Drickus fight. Some people will say before it, I can maybe see it, but I, I'm going to say after the Drickus fight because Drickus had a great performance against him and Whitaker didn't have many moments. So it was hard to really say if he was over the hill by the time he fought Drickus. But definitely in the Costa fight, just like uh, with Max Holloway, when you look at the details of his techniques, you definitely do see a slight decline in his game. But what do you do with him now? And he has a lot of opponents that he can go up against. He could go against uh, Strickland, Hamzat. That's pretty much it. Or maybe an Adesanya rematch. But there was that rumor that Adesanya might be fighting Hamzat. And then Dana came out and said that that's completely false. Watch when that fight actually happens. I'm, I wonder why not. I I'm very confused with some of the decisions about the matchmaking. Like, why was Connor and Chandler not on UFC 300? I'm very confused as to why it wasn't. I mean, you have Michael Chandler calling him out in the WWE. This guy is going on every broadcast, calling out Conor McGregor. I feel so bad for the guy. He could have had like two fights by now. They promised that they were going to fight last year. That didn't happen. They were supposed to fight early this year. That didn't happen. Like what's going on with Chandler and Conor? Who's the one that's holding back that fight? I guarantee it's not Chandler. This guy's going all over the world calling Conor out. I mean, next time we're going to see him in Bollywood wondering where Conor is. He's going to see if he's at that old pub where that legend was that took Connor's punch. And not only that, then why not Izzy versus Hamzat? It's a great fight that would sell so much. That's a pay-per-view main event kind of fight. And I guarantee it would sell like 700,000 buys or something. That would be an enormous fight for the UFC that most fights are not going to generate that much notoriety. Arguably the two biggest names, I don't know about Strickland, where his numbers are, but uh, we'll say Strickland, Adesanya, and Hamza are like the three biggest names in the middleweight division. If you have two of them fight each other, I don't understand why not to do it. You know, one of them, neither of them are champions. It's not going to hold up the division at all. It's a great fight. A lot of people have been wanting to see that for a long time. I don't understand why, like the, the matchmaking is so confusing. 
And they said that they were talking about Leon versus uh, Shafkat, Leon versus Islam, and I think Leon versus Hamza was it? And they never made any of those fights. They said that it wasn't Leon's fault. I think the only reason why those fights didn't happen is because UFC 300 was during Ramadan, and all three of those fighters that they asked were Muslim fighters. But Hamza has fought during Ramadan before, and I think he just came out and said that he didn't take the, the fight with Leon Edwards because it wouldn't give him enough time to cut the weight, which means that he was at least thinking about fighting Leon for 300. But I don't know, is that better than Pereira vs. Hill. I think I like Pereira vs. Hill more. Personally, I think both those two guys are exciting to watch. Whereas Leon and Hamza, Hamza's definitely fun, but Leon, not as fun as those other three. Poor Bilal Muhammad, man. They didn't even ask Bilal. And he's the number one contender. I mean, Leon's been saying he's going to get the title shot. Dana even said he's going to get the title shot. And then when it came to it, they didn't even ask him. They're like trying to be nice to him or something. I don't understand. Poor Bilal, man. Like, dang. They didn't even ask him. They asked all these other guys. They even asked a middleweight. He's a middleweight now, Hamza. They asked him. They asked a lightweight that has the number one contender. When you really think about it, if you were like Bilal's manager, what would you tell him to do? Like, what is the game plan here to, to draw interest for fans to watch him fight? Does he just turn heel completely? Does he just become like a villain in the UFC or something? Because Colby Covington at one point in his career was in a similar position where before he fought Damian Maya, nobody cared to watch him fight. And I remember those days. And then he completely turned heel and made people excited to watch him fight just because of the things that he used to say and you would keep winning. So it became almost like that chill son and kind of figure but winning, Chael's undisputed, undefeated. He lets he let all those guys beat him. But with Blah Muhammad, does he do the same thing as Colby Covington? Does he just turn heel and become a character? But I'm going to be completely honest, man. I'm sick of the characters. All right, can we just get some real guys? Even when Ilya did it, it was kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me. I'm like, all right, a lot of it is cringe. I understand what he's doing. I appreciate he's rising the stakes because not only was he talking trash, I knew he was making the documentary and he posted the thing on Instagram and he's talking about, you know, he's going to knock Volk out so easily and he's talking about, or he posed with the belt and all that stuff, you know, so it was more than just his character during the press conference. There was this whole thing that he was doing, but I don't know, man. The character stuff is getting kind of old, I think. There's so many people are trying it, so many people attempted, and it's just the fakeness is a little bit much, I think. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. It was cool when Chill did it back in the day because he did it so well, and I even think if Bilal can do it well, right, if he becomes a great actor and just, like, able to sell his character, then by all means, do it. But most of these guys, I, this is the issue. Most of these guys don't know how to act, right? They don't know how to play a character. They're not great actors. So sometimes it feels flat. But if Blaw can do it, he should. Because he needs people to get excited about his fights. I mean, the fact that the brass did not even ask him for a title shot. And speaking of Costa about that uh, Robert Whitaker fight, that might have been his last shot to get to a belt. He's been out for such a long time, he barely ever fights. His whole prime was inactive. You know, like, he hasn't really done much. Imagine he continued to fight three times a year instead of once. How much better Polo Costa would have been? Because he's super talented. He's a very athletic guy. I think kind of like Cejudo, he hurt his own career by sitting out for so long. I, I know Costa, sometimes he got injured and stuff like that. But then there were other times where it was like business deals, negotiations, and all this stuff. And he kind of just sat out. He believed he was worth more than he was. Remember the whole issue with Marvin Vittori? Like, even Dana came out and said in the press conference, you know, Costa's not that easy to work with. You know, when we can get him in the cage, though, he fights. But we got to get him in the cage. And that could have been the last time Costa had an opportunity to fight for a belt. Because I think now, and they might give him someone ranked below him. I know he fought Luke Rockhold, so that was someone who was definitely ranked below. But he's a legend, and that was a whole thing about that fight. But in terms of someone in the rankings, like maybe fighting a Brendan Allen or Nazardin Imovov, someone like that I think should be next for Paulo Costa. He could fight Hamzat. Right, he's technically ranked below him. That's a fight they could put together because Costa still brings a, a bit of a name value to these fights. Marab Davalashvili, I believe the best 135er in the world until proven otherwise. Maybe Sean O'Malley can catch him, but the way Sean O'Malley would beat Marab is the way he beats almost everybody. Right, It's the same chance, it's the same game plan, same approach against everybody. Walk them into, you know, lure them into a punch. That's how he beats most of these guys. And it's nothing different against Marab. Maybe he throws a flying knee instead of a punch, right? Maybe a different technique, but the approach is still kind of the same. The game plan's still similar. Marab does lower that right hand, and he does get caught on the chin. He happened the same way against uh, Marais and Cejudo. They both caught him the same way. They both entered the pocket with the right and then fired off the follow-up left hook, and he dropped his hand on both of those, getting rocked in both of those moments. And we know Cheeto has a very good left hook, or should I say a very powerful left hook. Super dangerous. 
dangerous left hook. And if he can get something like that on Marab's chin, Marab might go down because Cheeto has some insane power. He just doesn't throw much. Corey Sandhagen can catch him with something crazy, but I think Corey gets ragdolled a little bit. I think he gets taken down, and I think Marab controls him while he's on top as Corey is trying to scramble for the leg and the arm and just going for all these different submissions, similar to what he did against TJ. But TJ is no wrestler like Marab is. TJ's a very good wrestler, definitely out of his prime, but he was definitely not at the level of Marab's wrestling when he fought Corey Sanhagen. We might have to wait to see one of these uh, prospects at 135 come up. Song Yudong is an interesting one. He's not a prospect, but he's so young. He might get to a level where he surpasses Marab in the future. Right now, it's dangerous. Song has some decent takedown defense. If anybody can fire off a fast and powerful left hook in the pocket like that, it is someone like Song Yudong. But I think Marab is going to have very good entries for those single legs to get to get Song to the ground. We might have to we might have to wait and see what Umar is all about. Look at all the the bantamweights. A lot of them cannot wrestle with Marab at all, like zero. The only guy that can is Eljamain, but Eljamain's up at featherweight. I believe Eljamain is actually the guy that could beat Marab because of how dangerous he is on the ground and because of how effective he is at his wrestling too. Marab is not a great technical striker. He's not really good there. He's not great with his jiu-jitsu either. So that's going to allow someone like Eljamain to catch him with certain shots from distance and you know not be completely out techniqued or out skilled in the stand up and definitely not when it comes to the ground he's definitely better than Marab there but the fight would never happen so like if you look at everybody else you look at Corey Sanhagen I think he gets ragdolled Pietro Jan same thing happens again until he fixes that low activity style that he has because as long as he's going to be low in activity Marab is always going to beat him Cheeto has a very similar weakness as well and that's why I think Marab beats him and ragdolls him on the ground Cejudo we saw that Cejudo actually had the most difficult style outside of Aljamain Sterling out of anybody in the top five Song is an interesting one I think he's a bit dangerous for Marab, but I think Marab does get it done. I think Davidson gets controlled on the ground. Rob Font, similar. You know, Jonathan Martinez as well, even though he's the dark horse at 135. I think he doesn't have what it takes to beat someone like Marab. Dominic Cruz gets beat. Pedro Munoz gets beat. Mario Batista gets beat. Ricky Simone, same thing. Umar is an interesting one because it seems like he's the only guy that can wrestle on that level. And because he has that wrestling factor, he can contest with Marab Davalashvili theoretically we don't know yet because he hasn't fought anybody great just stylistically Umar is a guy that could present a lot of problems for Marab he is a good striker he's better technically it looks like than Marab in the stand-up he has more power he has extremely good kicks he trains at a very good gym has great training partners that can emulate something that Marab does I mean the fact that he can train with Habib is such a benefit to him to prepare for someone like Marab so if there's anybody I believe that beats Marab in the future it might be Umar Nurmagomedov, or it could be someone like Song Yudong, which leads me to believe that Marab is going to get the belt. He's going to defend that title maybe two or three times before either Song or Umar fights him. And I think that's when Marab loses. There's a big wave of fans that are getting behind Marab Davalashvili. And I think the UFC may have noticed this, right? Especially with how crazy the fans at the in the arena were going during the press conference and then in the fight, because he could potentially be a fun champion for the bantamweight division. Sean O'Malley has the ideal look and the ideal fighting style, but he just doesn't have the personality that Marab has. Right? Marab might not be as fun to watch when he fights as O'Malley is. He doesn't have the same kind of look, but man, is he a fun personality. Man, He's one of the few fighters in the UFC that actually have an exciting personality. Like, he seems like a guy that it would be just fun to be around him, you know? Genuine guy, really good, really cool, high energy, great sketches he makes. I mean, he makes the best sketches out of any fighter. He has the personality that can really sell as a champion, right? And if he can go on a dominant run, that would alleviate some of the, the boringness that some fans see in his fighting style, right? If he gets like five title defenses and breaks the record or something, the fans will overlook all of that, right? It's kind of how they did it with GSP. GSP was boring for so much of his title reign, but because of how dominant he was and how often he would win, he also did have Canada behind him. But a lot of fans, even in, a, in even in the United States, overlooked all of that. If Elon Musk was able to grab Marab's personality and thrust it into Sean O'Malley, you would have the biggest star in the UFC. And I heard Kurt O'Malley was saying in an interview that he needs to work on that, you know, that character and stuff. And I'm like, why though? It's not who you are. Just be who you are. Be genuine. Be authentic. You know, when you're not authentic and you're faking your personality, everybody sees it and it just doesn't come off fun. That's why a lot of people thought Henry Cejudo was so cringe. It wasn't just because he was playing a character. It's because of how inauthentic it was. He's not cringe like that in real life. We've seen Henry Cejudo be serious and he's not like that, right? When you're inauthentic, it comes off cringe and it comes off 
awkward and weird, off-putting, something like that. And that's what Sean O'Malley brings out there sometimes. Like, when he starts to talk trash, it doesn't seem like that's who he is. So it doesn't come off right. Whereas where Conor McGregor, that's who Conor is. So it comes off funny. It comes off clever and all this stuff because he's not trying to portray a character. He's just talking. Chill Sun had played a little bit of a character, but that's also kind of who he is too. When he was trash talking and building up the fight and all this stuff, the guy's a performer. O'Malley's a performer when it comes to his skill set, not on the mic. Nothing wrong with getting better on the mic. You know, nothing better would try to build up your fights and stuff, but don't just like full force get into this character that just comes off cringe. Like with Ilya Tapuria, a lot of fans were telling Ilya when he was uh, putting on the character in that press conference, a lot of people were saying, why don't you just be yourself? Because Ilya seems like a really cool guy. When you saw like his interactions with Volkanovsky, where they're able to talk to each other without the mic, Ilya seems like a very cool, genuine guy who's just looking to chase his dreams. If he just went that direction and just spoke from who he is, it would sell so much better than playing with like a Conor McGregor kind of uh, personality that he was trying to put out there. I understand the, the angle he's trying to take because he was fighting the legend just like Conor did against Aldo and he was trying to take the belt. He was a dominant force in the featherweight division so far. He has the knockout power and all this stuff. So he was painting a similar image, which is completely understandable. But now he's the champ. Now he's the man. You know, all the eyes are going to be on him. The spotlight's on him. The cameras are on him. Everybody's going to put a mic in his face. I think now is the best time for Ilya Tapuria to just be genuine. Can you imagine if Alex Pereira was trying to talk like Conor McGregor? Nobody would like him for it. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody would think it's weird. But because he's just who he is, he kind of just stands there. People love it. They find it hilarious. They find his like uh, his candid, nonchalant personality with the way that he looks. You know, he looks like a menacing figure, like a guy who you definitely don't want to mess with. It makes it like appealing for a lot of fans, you know, and the way that he fights. He's such a devastating striker and becoming one of the biggest legends in the sport. People love it. Like when did people start to like John Jones? Unironically, people really got behind John Jones when he started to play the villain. He played into the villain. He was being who he actually was. He was talking about, you know, I beat you after doing some coke. And when he told Daniel Cormier that the fans love it because it's like, oh, he's finally being himself. This is the guy that everybody said John Jones actually is. How many fighters used to say John Jones is not this lovable, humble, genuine guy behind the cameras? He's a different person, man. And it's exactly what Daniel Cormier specifically was saying. And maybe because they did have a bit bad blood, but other fighters are saying it as well. Other fighters said, you know, he's a party guy. He does all this crazy stuff. He ain't like he's portraying on the camera. And then when you saw the glimpse of who John Jones was in that one interview where he thought that the cameras were down and the mics were off and he started to talk to Daniel Cormier a completely different way. I remember watching that and I'm like, whoa. So all these fighters were right? John Jones is actually like this? I think he just played into it more. He started to be who he really was, right? In that second Daniel Cormier fight, that was the John Jones that everybody's been waiting to see. And unironically, with the DC rivalry, it was his biggest fight in his career in terms of official pay-per-view buys. We don't know how much the Surreal Gone fight sold. There are some rumors uh, from Ali Abdelaziz that it sold a million buys. But so far as we know, that Daniel Cormier fight was the biggest. John Jones went from this humble, genuine fighter to this party-going, drug-sniffing, dark villain. And the fans were more interested and that guy. So let's get right to the questions because we do have a lot of them. And we're going to start with Troy Hartung. Hoping you're having a great day, Weasel. Two questions. Thank you, man. You too. Number one, is Jim Miller the first fighter you've seen in the UFC that's in their super late 30s, early 40s and below the 170 pound division to have a lot of success at the end of their career? Emphasis on just the UFC with this question because competition in the other orgs are not the same level mostly. If there are other fighters that compare to him in this, will becoming a ranked fighter at the age of 40, if he beats Bobby Green, put him at the top of this list? Let me think. Early 40s, there are other fighters that have had a lot of success, but most of them have been in the heavier divisions. Like You can point out to a lot of different fighters, but, but below 170, Josh Emmett is technically in his late 30s, and he just knocked out Bryce Mitchell and also fought for the belt not too long ago. So he's a, another fighter that's having some success while in his late 30s. Uriah Faber when he came back and beat Ricky Simone, but you know, it's a different situation there. I will say there has been no other fighter at this age with as many fights as he has comparable to Jim Miller, right? It's not just, you know, the success he's having in terms of his age because his 40-year-old self is different than other fighters' 40-year-old because he's had so many fights at the top level of the sport. This guy was a top-ranked fighter before. People forget about that. At one point in his career, when he was like in his early 30s, late 20s, he was one of the top like five or top 10 best lightweights in the world. Right around the time he was fighting like Benson Henderson, Nate Diaz, and he's still around 
after so many years where all these other guys are gone, or most of them are, and he's still around winning. He's not the highest ranked guy at his older age. Again, we do have Josh Emmett, who's in the top 10 still, but he doesn't have as long of a career as Jim Miller has. That's why it's very different. So if he goes and beats Bobby Green and goes into the top 15 of the lightweight rankings yet again, breaking into the rankings, I mean, come on. And then your second question, can you see any other fighters right now in that age bracket and that are in the 155 pound division or lower having a ton of future success in their MMA career? One that comes to mind is probably Michael Johnson. He's still showing that he's got a ton of speed with his hands, and it looks like he's going to be using his wrestling way more often now based on what he said in his press conference after the Flowers fight. Yeah, absolutely. Michael Johnson's going into like this whole veteran route where, you know, maybe I'm not going to be able to outbox everybody. I'm not going to be able to overpower everybody, and I'm not the same athletic guy as I used to be in my prime. I got to use my skill set. I got to use my mind. I got to use my brain here. And I do expect him to use a lot more wrestling in the future while co- while containing a bit of the hand speed at his older age that still is very impressive to see today. But I don't see any of these guys having the same kind of success as Jim Miller. It's insane. It's a, it's a complete anomaly. I mean, even legends cannot have the same kind of success Jim Miller has at his age with how many fights he has when we're talking about the lower weight class because heavyweight and light heavyweight and middleweight are a bit different. Then we go to Richard Connolly. I've got three questions for you. If an opponent of Islam insulted Habib's dad and Islam's mentor, Abdul Manap, saying he was in hell and at the pre-fight press conference in a Russian language or using the Muslim term, Arab term, how'd you see Islam reacting? Worse than how Leon reacted with what Colby said or do you think he'd have more composure? Also, if the opponent said it in Abu Dhabi, do you think they'd have to really watch out for themselves despite being in the world's safest city? Um, I don't know. How would Islam react? He seems like a very calm person, so I do expect him to stay calm because he knows that he's going to fight the guy. Islam's a smart guy, and I think he would hold himself a bit composed. At least that's what I think. In terms of would that guy have to watch himself if he said in Abu Dhabi? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, there might be some guy that tries to do something to him. Is it really the world's safest city? Is that true? And then number two, if Volk gets KO'd first round or second round by Elias, so this is a question before the fight. It's actually interesting to look at this now. Uh, by Elia, where do you see his career trajectory going from there? And what would you want him to do? Chase the title again, be a gatekeeper at featherweight, or move up to lightweight for fun money fights with people like Gaethje, Connor, or Poirier. I think, you know, now that we know he did lose and got knocked out in the first or second round, I think he should take a long time off. I think he should get to the title again, fight Ilya Taburia. He might lose again, most likely. And at that point, maybe retire, because what else does he have to prove? He tried his hand at the lightweight title twice. It didn't work. Um, He got very close the first time, which just shows how great of a fighter he is. He was a long reigning featherweight champion, an absolute legend in the sport, future Hall of Famer. There's nothing really left to prove unless he wants the money fights. That's I, essentially the only thing left for him. Just make as much money as possible if you want to continue to compete. Because if he gets knocked out by Tapuria again, I think he should avoid guys like Gaethje and Poirier and some of these other powerful fighters, bigger than him too, and still in their prime, right? Maybe Conor McGregor would be a route that he can go to. Maybe if Charles declines and you know he fights him instead or any of these other guys just for a money fight, that would be ideal. But I think he should retire after that. Number three, do you think this pathway would destroy Volk's legacy? And if yes, how badly? Loses to Ilya, then loses to him again in a rematch, both by finish, then loses to Max Holloway in their fourth fight, 50-45 by a decision, then loses to Ortega in a rematch, next he loses to Arnold Allen, and then finally loses to Diego Lopez, and then retires on a five-fight skid? He goes on a Tony Ferguson kind of skid? I cannot see that with another legend, right? It happened with BJ Penn, and then it happened with Tony Ferguson. I don't want to see the same thing happen for Volk. If that were to happen, to him yet it would taint his legacy it would be really hard to look at the the reign that he had because he was in seven times in that fashion no that'd be crazy i don't even want to think about that man no that would be horrible but yeah it would hurt his legacy a lot how badly i mean nobody would consider him the greatest featherweight of all time people might even start considering max holloway greater than him at that point they're with a nano peach Good to be back as always. Hey, Weasel. Hoping you and your family are doing good. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, I've been spending a lot of time with them. Yeah, thank you so much, though, man. The family's doing good. I hope yours are doing well, too. And uh, to answer your questions, now that Pfeiffer has been fraud-checked, are expecting any other contenders to be fraud-checked as well? I think Ian Gary and Jelton Almeida. 
Then number two, why do you think the 35 and over curse is so relevant? Luke Thomas tweet about champs who are 35 or older with their record is 2 and 32 or something. I believe this is only for 170 and down. It's harder to stay technical at an older age because of how skilled those uh, divisions are. And they can't necessarily rely on power the same way, right? There are a lot of even middleweights that could just rely on power to get by and win big fights. Whereas if you're a 135er, it's very difficult to do so. And we know at an older age, power is the last thing to go. But who cares about power when you're a 135er and 37 years old? It's usually not going to make too much of a difference. And most of the smaller guys are more athletic too. And we know that athletic ability declines when you get older. So you cannot hang with the same competition physically. Then we go to Mike. Hey, Weasel. It's great to see any podcast video you have. I've only got one question, but it's pretty long. So question. Do you think the close fight with Islam the first time and what happened after it is what may have or will set up the chain reaction of Volk's downfall? So this is the context. Before the Makashev fight, Makashev said that he had a bad weight cut and due to Perth's rehydration time, he only got 24 hours to rehydrate, which caused him to feel weak and fatigued during the fight and not at his best. The thing is though, during the fight, Volk said repeatedly to his corner that Islam didn't feel strong, which means that he took to heart that Islam wasn't as strong and didn't think the weight cut and rehydration time played an issue. Then at the end of the fight, he drops Islam, probably getting a huge ego boost, along with a feeling he cracked the Dagestani puzzle and he feels like he's the man. Along with this, Hooker, Joe Lopez, and his team are probably feeding him information that Islam took an IV and that he won. So therefore, he feels even better about himself that he beat an Islam who needed to cheat. Along with this, the whole public is giving him praises, glazing him so he takes it to heart and believes in his own hype and believes he beat Islam and is the world's best fighter. Then he beats Yair and after that says in an interview that, quote, nobody can actually beat me, end quote, which shows he truly believes he's the best and has now taken all that glazing to heart. After that, he has surgery and is in a bad spot, not training, drinking daily, beating himself up, and the opportunity opens up to fight Islam on short notice in the rematch. Volk, due to his pre-existing beliefs that he beat an Islam who needed to cheat, and the fact that he has coaches who probably fed that belief to him, accepted the fight, and we all know what happened. He got KO'd. So my final question is, is Volk's loss to Ilya Tapuria at UFC 298 the catalyst that caused this, in your opinion, the close fight with Islam, Volk believed he won, and if not completely, did it play a part? So that's an interesting chain of reasoning. It could have been, but I don't necessarily think so, because the way he lost to Ilya Tapuria, I think he doesn't stop that from happening, because it wasn't the fact that he got knocked out by Islam in the second fight that led to his knockout loss to Ilya Tapuria. Ilya fired off the shot that I don't think any version of Volkanovski could ever take. And he trapped him against the fence. Volk looked good technically. Like when it came to his movements and stuff, there were some differences, right? There were some differences. He didn't faint as much. He didn't set up his strikes as much. But I don't think it has something to do with him being physically lacking because of him getting knocked out before or because of his age or something. And I think he's just expecting something a little bit different from Ilya. And TJ Dillashaw actually had a very interesting opinion on this. He said he believes that Volk was a little bit afraid of Tapuria in terms of like the way he was fighting. He was trying to keep distance and just kick at him. He believes that he was kicking with the left leg toward the arm to kind of soften up the arm, which I don't believe. I mean, maybe he was doing that, but he was firing a lot to the legs as well. And he was also leaning away from Tapuria constantly to not get hit to the head with the right hand. It's an interesting take from TJ Dillashaw. And I think the only thing that you can relate that to his previous knockout loss was that he was afraid of getting knocked out again. Maybe that's a bit of a factor going into the Tapuria fight, but that was a clean win for Tapuria. If Volk could, let's say if Volk was able to take that right hand, that left hook follow-up from Tapuria would have ended him because that was a more powerful punch coming his way. And then we go to Mike Griffith. I know this is a matter of opinions, but can we all agree that Michelle Pereira is the most entertaining UFC fighter in history? I'm not saying he's the most skilled, talking, or about pure entertainment. Do you agree that he's the most entertaining ever? Even above Conor, Gaethje, and even Michael Chandler. The only reason no one takes him more seriously is because he's never beat a big guy. If he beat a Dustin Poirier or a Justin Gaethje, and he does it while doing all those flips on the cage and stuff, people would be talking about him more than even champions. Do you agree? No, I don't agree that he's the most entertaining ever. I understand what you're saying. He's so crazy, flips and spins and throws crazy strikes out there. And yeah, that could be very fun to watch. But when it's not effective, people get bored of seeing it. You know, if he's winning doing that stuff, yeah, he probably has the potential to become the most entertaining fighter ever. Uh, if he beats big guys on the level of, you know, let's say Leon Edwards or Shavkat or Kamar Usman doing that, yeah, then absolutely people would take him more seriously. Then we go to James Young. Patty versus Money Moicano. Oh, Moicano. 100%. Then we go to Ascendant King. Who had the more impressive title reign between Alex Volkanovsky, Israel, or Kamaru? 
Those are the three long reigning champions of the most recent generation. It's going to depend on what you mean by impressive. Because Kamaru had the most exciting title reign. The most like risky in a sense. Specifically with the way that he fought most of these guys. Adesanya had the longest with the best competition in terms of like scaling them to their weight class. But he did it in a boring way, right? It wasn't as impressive to see the performance of Adesanya. But the numbers and how long it was, that's what was impressive. And then for Volkanovski, it's a bit of a mix, right? Long reign, longer than Usman's. Some of it was very tough, especially against Max Holloway. He almost got submitted by Brian Ortega. So it's a bit of a mix between Adesanya, Kamaru, Usman. I would ultimately say that Volkanovski had the most impressive title reign out of the three. He beat high-level competition. He finished some of these guys. He got put in risky positions and got out of them and came back. So I would say ultimately Alexander Volkanovsky had the most impressive title reign of those three, but it's subjective. It depends what you look at. They go to Intent Chief. I recently read the buffer tips, his split decisions, and can't help but notice it. He'll look to the loser, then swing his head to the winner. Bruce has done this for Strickland versus DDP, Jones versus Reyes, Sterling versus Cejudo, Sterling versus Jan, O'Malley versus Jan, and Patty versus Gordon to name a few. Have you ever noticed this? Also, could you rank the major referees in terms of their performance quality? Love the podcast. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, man. I was always trying to notice a pattern, of, but sometimes I don't see it. I think it's mostly I'm, I'm trying to notice it when it's not a split decision. But yeah, I'm going to look at these fights. I'm going to see if the pattern is actually there. Now, referees in terms of their performance quality, I really like Jason Herzog. No ref is going to be perfect. They're all going to be questionable in some ways, but I like Jason Herzog. I think he's probably the best ref. I also like Mike Beltron. Those two, in my opinion, are the best refs. Herb Dean's fallen a bit. You know, he used to be the gold standard at one point, but I think now it's Jason Herzog. Mark Goddard used to be really good at one point too. Then we go to Fob King Dingling. How effective is yelling in someone's ear when they're engaging in a grappling exchange? It only takes 130 decibels to rupture an eardrum, which can cause vertigo, loss of balance, and can prevent a fighter from hearing advice from their coach in the corner. Could this be an effective strategy for a fighter? Can you imagine a fight ends because you rock your opponent with vertigo due to screaming in their ear? I'm trying to be all like Sindel from Mortal Kombat. No, this would not be effective. If you're screaming in someone's ear, you're also going to be gas yourself out trying to give them vertigo. Ago, and I think a human uh, voice can reach like 125 decibels at the highest and the average is about like 100. So I don't know if you could rupture their eardrum unless you're Eddie Alvarez's wife. She's ruined every Eddie fight for me because you just hear her screeching from the audience like a banshee. Like when Eddie fought Mendez at BKFC, once you hear her scream once, you cannot stop hearing it and it ruins the fight. And I honestly don't know why she screams like that. And also, when you're screaming in someone's ear as hard as you can, you're going to be tensing your body up, right? Which is going to be hard to use technique and flow on the ground, right? You don't want to be so tense when you're grappling with your opponent. There's way better things to do than scream in the ear. Then we go to Alan Combs. Dear Wise Weasel, if you were Ian Gary, God forbid, what do you think you would do to try and win back the fans? Or... Would you turn full heel and play into everything? Love the content, man. Thank you so much. Ian Gary should probably play the heel because he seems to be good at that. It got everybody to talk about him in the first place. I mean, his whole angle at Neil Magny was essentially turning heel. So might as well just keep it going. It's the personality that got people talking about him in the first place. So might as well keep going with it unless he just doesn't care. I, the thing is, he doesn't want to win the fans back, though. If he wanted to win the fans back, yeah, probably turn full heel. People love winners at the end of the day. And if he keeps winning with being the villain, essentially, I think that would be a good strategy for him. Then with the MA, what are the best weightlifting exercises that complement combat sports the most? Pretty much all the traditional ones. You know, you, when you look at bench pressing, squats, deadlifts, that's all going to be good for you. But it's going to depend on what you're trying to work for. You could do the high reps and low weight as well. You don't want to just focus on getting as big as you can, ripped up as much as possible and all that stuff. And lifting too heavy of weights could restrict your muscle flexibility. So you definitely want to lift in moderation, not all the time. Um, but all the traditional stuff should be good for you. Remember that you're not going to learn anything about fighting when you're lifting by lifting weights. You're simply building your body so you can learn things for fighting. So the weight training does not have to be complicated. Plyometrics are also very good. Body weight exercises, you know, push-ups, pull-ups, abdominal workouts, all of it. All of it should be really good. When it comes to lifting weights, the more complicated you make it, the less effective it's usually going to be. That's essentially what I've learned throughout the years. The basic stuff 
are the best stuff. Just make it as simple as possible. Those are the most effective ways to lift weights and just get those gains, even for a sport like MMA, because lifting weights is not going to be as essential as learning technique, you know? So they would get their hands worst. How many Sergei Spivox would it take to beat one polar bear? And what would be their game plan? Yo, polar bears are terrifying. They're like, I think the second biggest bear in the world, right after the Kodiak bear. And there are apex predators, man. How many Sergei Spivox? And they're all attacking the bear at once? If they're all attacking the bear at once, maybe 15 Sergei Spivox, like three or four of them are going to be bait. And while the bear is busy with those Spivox, then the other like 10 or 11 Spivox are, what do they even do to the bear? <laughs> what do they even, do they punch him? Two Spivox has his neck in some weird, efficient way. Let's say they're able to do that. Four Spivox getting this thing in a knee bar, but it wouldn't even be a knee bar. All the other Spivox blasting it with kicks and punches and stuff. A, a few of them will get smacked and sliced up in the process, but I think eventually the 15 Spivox will eventually beat that polar bear. Maybe. I don't even know. Bears are so insanely powerful. Their claws are like knives. They have an extreme bite force. They can climb trees faster than a human can. They can swim. They can run faster. They're coated up in their skin, fat, muscle, and fur like they're a tank. I don't even know if you can choke it out. Can you choke out a bear? I did see Luke Rockle choking the bull. That was pretty crazy. And Spivak is bigger than Luke Rockle, so maybe, maybe he can pull it off. Then we're going to Eric Cardenas. If the UFC were to add the 165 pound division tomorrow, who would be the champion and what would be the top five in a year time based on who you think would move up or move down into the division? So the champion is going to be Conor McGregor and the only guy in the top five is going to be Michael Chandler before they dissolve that division to claim Conor is the first ever three division champion and only 165 pound champion in UFC history. Greatest fighter of all time. No one's ever done it. No one will ever be able to do it. Because the division doesn't exist. No, but um, I believe Islam Makhachev would be the 165 pound champion. I think the top five would look like, in no order, Michael Chandler, Bilal Muhammad, Gilbert Burns, Dustin Poirier. But I have a feeling Justin would stay at 155. If Justin stays at 155, then maybe Colby Covington, if he performs. Then we're going to Zay. Break down a potential Holloway versus Ilya matchup. Ooh, this would be a tough one. I'm going to think about Holloway as we saw him last time against Korean Zombie. Max does engage in close range. He definitely does. He will exchange shots with Ilya Tapuria. I think Ilya will eat a bunch of jabs as Max engages. But I think he will end those exchanges with the right hand. Bombing on Max Holloway, but he has to really watch out for knees to the head and head kicks. Ilya's got a good chin. He could take a lot of the punches from Max. And throughout the fight, Ilya is going to be pressuring Max to the fence and cutting him off constantly. We're going to see a bit of a reminiscent performance like Conor, McGregor, like Conor put on Max Holloway back in the day where he was cutting him off pretty well throughout parts of that fight. But I think Ilya would be more consistent, jabbing his way on the inside, throwing the right hand, and tagging Holloway. But Holloway is going to be able to take it. I think he will clinch up with Ilya. But that backfires as it gets taken to the ground. He stands up a couple times, but eats some shots on the way up. Ilya disengages with some big punches to the body and to the head, but Max is able to get away because of the openings from the power punches. And I think Max is going to throw some body kicks and head kicks. He might hurt Ilya at one point of the fight due to a head kick, but I think Ilya is going to come back, shoot the takedown to reset the fight. He takes Max to the ground, and Max gives up his back to try to explode back up to get this finish, secure the win. But Ilya gets his back and chokes him out, winning an extremely exciting fight. Then we get to Gina Kamaglia. How did Marab turn his image around so quickly? People are starting to get familiar with his personality. You know, they're starting to love him. But another reason is because people also recognize that O'Malley's not that interesting outside the cage. Whereas Marab is. And when someone has a great personality like Marab, people are going to get behind him. He also knows how to play with the crowd, you know, with the whole Mexican flag against Henry Cejudo. It was perfect. And who knows what he's going to do against Sean O'Malley at a press conference and the stuff he says. Because he's not being vulgar. He's not being disrespectful to his opponent or anything. He's getting the fans on his side while also being respectful to his opponent. And then he overwhelms them in the fight. If some of you have not checked out his sketches, you have to see them, man. They're so funny. Then final question, we're going to go to Mahal. Now that we've seen the best version of Ilya Tapuria perform against Volkanovski and win the belt, how do you think he does against the featherweight and lightweight top 10? So in the featherweight division for Ilya Tapuria, I think he beats Bryce Mitchell, knocks out Giga, but has to watch out for the head kick. I don't think they'll ever fight each other. I think he outboxes Kelvin Cater, puts him on the back foot and just wails on him. I think Cater would eventually succumb to the power, but it could also get taken to the ground as Ilya is superior there too. I think he beats Arnold Allen. I think he beats Mavsar Evloev, beats Brian Ortega, Yair, barely beats Max and a very good fight then I think he beats Volkanovski for lightweight I think he beats Dan Hooker Jalen Turner is dangerous 
because he could do exactly what Jai Herbert did to him, but Ely has gotten so much better since. I'm going to go to Puria. Jalen is a bit defenseless at times. Jalen sometimes focuses way too much on his offense and forgets putting his guard up and moving his head. Rafael Fiziev. I would go with Ilya to Puria, but that's a very tough fight for him. Dariush gets knocked out. Gamra gets knocked out. I think he beats Chandler, but man, is that going to be a crazy first round. Arman Saryukian. Man, that's a tough fight because if he could stuff Armin's takedowns, he's going to win. But Armin's very strong, man. He's such a good wrestler. I can see him taking Tapuria to the ground and controlling him. But you know what? I'm going to go with Tapuria, but that's a tough one. That could go either way. Dustin Poirier, I'm going to go with Dustin. He can handle himself in the pocket with Tapuria, I believe. He's also much bigger. Justin Gaethje, I got to also go with Gaethje. Way too big and great enough of a striker to not get blasted out. And Charles Oliveira, again, much bigger than Tapuria. Tapuria does not want to go to the ground with him. He needs to blast him and knock him out. And I think he could do it. But Oliver has such a big reach advantage on him. But he does walk at the punches. This fight can go either way, honestly. I don't even know who'd win. The only thing that's keeping Oliveira, the only thing that could beat Oliveira is the fact that he just doesn't move his head. And against someone like Tapuria, that's very dangerous. But maybe Oliveira's early pressure can get to Tapuria before Tapuria gets going. So I'm going to pick Charles Oliveira. And then Islam Makashev, Islam beats him. And that's the end of the episode, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you didn't, make sure to give it a like. Make sure to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. And I'll see you guys in the next video.